Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for the What Now Tech Talk, Power Engineering, Sensing the SAPP and Developing Water Security in South Africa. This is me, I'm your host, Ming Savarabas, the Managing Editor for What Now. I just want to go through some webinar considerations for, your, for yourself. Um, attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on their device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. By default, the control panel is located on the right hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of the presentation will be made available on the SAIE YouTube channel, SAIE TV. The recording will also be made available on the SAIE website under the events drop down menu in the section past events and webinars. This page is updated regularly, so ensure you check back as often as possible for new uploads and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more uploads. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar, once we have received the CPD validation number for this webinar from EXA. I would like to introduce our sponsor, um, Ryan Collier, Acting CEO for Rosatom Central in Southern Africa. Ryan. Thank you very much. I'm just busy sharing my video. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting us, uh, firstly, to be a sponsor and as well to give a short overview of who we are. Uh, we think that webinars like this are incredibly important, and, and I look forward to the discussion um, after this. Uh, just a, a heads up from my side, I'm not a technical person. I am marketing and public relations, um, so I will attempt so any technical questions but those that I can't answer I will take an email or written form and I'll have them answered by our technical team. Uh, so just a quick introduction of who Rosatom is. Uh, Rosatom is the Russian state-owned nuclear corporation. We're made up of roughly 250 companies and we employ around 250,000 employees um, authority in Russia. Obviously our core business is the construction and operation of big block nuclear power plants. Um, we are vertically integrated cover uh, company and therefore uh, we cover the entire nuclear value chain. So that includes uranium mining, uranium enrichment, fuel fabrication, equipment and manufacturing, uh, nuclear power plant design, construction and operation, power generation, as well as back end. Um, and then on the non-energy side, we cover nuclear medicine, multi-purpose irradiation centers, uh, research reactors and facilities, as well as nuclear icebreakers. Um, we've also diversified out of the nuclear sector, so we currently offer hydropower. Uh, we've acquired a wind company called Nova Wind, uh, who are currently busy with a number of um, wind projects in, in Russia. Um, and we are now ready for the international market on our wind as well. Um, so we have a focus on Africa for wind, so that, that is something that's very exciting for us too. Um, and then obviously we've got a big focus at the moment on water treatment facilities and desalination. Um, some of the key facts about us, we're number one in the world in terms of nuclear power plant backlogs. Uh, we've got over 30% of the global enrichment market. We've got over 14% of the global extraction market on uranium. Um, and we currently produce around 19% of Russia's electricity. Um, in terms of our desalination solutions, we offer a, a wide range of desal solutions, both for nuclear power plants, big block nuclear power plants, based on our NCR 1200 um, technology, on our small modular reactors, uh, which is based on the RITM 200 reactor, um, as well as the flow nuclear power plants, which are based on the same, same reactor. Um, in fact, we've got many years experience in desalination. Um, our BN-350 sodium cooled reactor um, in Kazakhstan on the, on the Caspian Sea has been supplying 135 megawatts of electrical power as well as 120,000 cubic meters of drinking water per day for the last 27 years. Uh, more recently, we installed a large desalination facility at Kurankulam, our uh, nuclear power plant in India. 
Um, the purpose of the project was to obtain water necessary for cooling um, during uh, reactor operation, as well as ensure drinking water supplies to the local population. Um, along with traditional methods of desalination, Rosasam also has new and innovative technologies, um, such as zero liquid charge technology, utilizes similar principles to traditional seawater desalination, um, but it's used for industrial. Um, the main principle of zero liquid discharge is to give oil and gas refineries the opportunity to become eco-friendly. Um, the technology is based on multi-stage evaporation, where wastewater is evaporated, leaving behind an easy-to-handle solid risk. Um, beyond these large-scale um, desalination offerings, uh, we've recently launched a small modularized uh, water filtration unit as well as desalination units. So these containerized units can be checked to the client's need, and the standard smaller unit um, is mounted to the back of a pickup truck, or is, can be mounted to the back of a pickup truck. These small units desal around one ton of water per hour, um, and can be uh, configured to handle various water conditions, including desalination. Um, these are fantastic for drought-stricken coastal areas, and we're putting a lot of focus on introducing them to the South African market at this point. Um, the units require very little setup and can be operational within six minutes and only require one operator for the units. Um, finally, the units are, are very small. They only require five kilowatts of electricity and therefore can be powered by either municipal um, power or a small generator which is standard in the unit, or they can be connected to a, solar, uh, a couple of solar panels to, to purify or desal water. Um, so yeah, that's, that's just a quick overview of Rosatom and our ambitions. Um, so after, after the presentations, I'm happy to answer a number of questions. And thanks again, Max, for the, for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Ryan, and thank you for being our sponsor today. <clears throat> our first presenter is Professor Pat Naidu. Dr. Naidu is Professor of Research in the Faculty of Engineering at the Built Environment, University of Johannesburg. He's a Fellow of the South African Academy of Engineers, a Fellow of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers, a senior member of IEEE, and a member of IET and CGRAE. He is a registered professional engineer and a specialist consultant in electrical energy and power systems. His current research interests are in sustainable development as driven by the green economy and industrial revolution 4.0. Dr. Naidu's four-decade industrial career was with the Electricity Supply Commission of South Africa from engineer training to non-executive director. I hand over the screen now to, to Professor Pat Naidu. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. I'm almost ready. Thank you, colleagues, and welcome to our conversation this afternoon. Uh, we're going to share with you some of the workings as in applications of technology for sustainable development. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the water portfolio. And uh, we had submitted a little article to what now? And here yeah, we had looked at the case study for the Western Cape of South Africa. The paper talks about the, the geography and the rainfall in the area. And we look at the issues around supply and demand, water imbalances, and the need for us to start employing alternative water resources such as seawater, wastewater, sanitation water. And uh, what urged us to, to write this little paper was, there's a new normal emerging, water shedding, load shedding. And we're starting to talk a lot about data, virtual power stations, virtual water. And then you start to wonder where we are. Then we get an experience that came through, the Western Cape Day Zero experience. And we looked at the South African Weather Service records. We found that for the period 2013, 2014, we had above normal rainfall. Periods 2014 all the way to 2016, there was just normal rainfall. 
Then we get a trigger in the period 2016, 2017, below normal rainfall. And it stabilized thereafter. And again, when we look at this topic of sustainable development, especially goal six, provision of clean water and sanitation for all, we believe there's, there's an argument for how best can we apply technology, in this case, small modular nuclear reactors, in contributing towards sustainable development. The technology is available. My colleague had just shared with you their workings, and uh, it's commercially available, and we need to bring this experience into our daily application, into daily living. When we look at water supply, we always say to ourselves, it's got to be affordable, accessible, reliable. It's got to be secure in an environment where demand is continuously increasing. And for us to meet that challenge, we have an option that given our sources only natural rainfall, snowfall, that of storage dams. And to meet the increasing demand, we could either raise the dam wall or start building new dams. We're saying possibly that's an option, but we should also consider that in the South African context, there is now a need and urgency in terms of investments in alternate water resources. How can we reuse sanitation water? It's been done. City of Windhoek in Namibia reuses their sanitation water. How can we reuse our wastewater? How can we reuse or employ coastal seawater in daily application? Given climate change and the change to rainfall patterns, my thoughts are that day zero will come back. And again, for us to ensure water security for all, we should be considering adding science, engineering, and technology as part of the solutions going forward. So if we take all the alternate water resources and move that through systems to give us fresh and clean water always, there's this need to add lots of heat. We need to bring lots of heat to that equation. And when we look at the heat source itself, again, all energy comes from the sun. And the fundamental is that energy is neither created nor destroyed. So our choices are in terms of that heat source. In real time, we could look at renewable, rene renewable resources. Or in stored energy time, we could look at the resources of coal or uranium as the energy carrier. And when we compare the various heat sources available to us, that's the sort of picture that emerges. We could either have a very small unit delivering large quantities of heat or a distributed arrangement of units or options to give us the required quantity of heat. So we're going to look a little bit about the technology around uranium and the small modular re reactor concept. Uranium is the energy carrier. And again, when we look at the SMR concept, it's a technology that promotes advanced industrialization plus specialized jobs in both quantity and quality. I, I've sort of put this point on the table for us to think a little bit deeply about it. When we look at our daily news, we've just heard the Denal CEOs resigned. South African Airways is going to be liquidated. Lots of jobs will become redundant. South Africa is unemployed. 30% and increasing. And then when we look at that background and we stand back and look at the nuclear investment that the country has made, we've got 2,000 megawatts out there at Kubag. And there's, I can assure you, right across South Africa and of all the various disciplines from front, front end to back end, there's more than 2,000 employees full time engaged in managing that 2,000 megawatt investment of South Africa's. So, so, so this technology gives us, as I said, specialized jobs in both quantity and quality. And it's something that we've got to consider and, uh, and embrace. The technology for, for, for promoting water security is in the laboratory. It's there. It's being played around. It's available. There's a lot of thinking going around. How best can we employ the heat, the decay heat of the reactor in terms of not just delivering on water, but 
also delivering on energy. So we could have a nexus of solutions come forward that could serve not just one outcome, but multiple outcomes. There's a wide, wide variety of choice for us. There's a lot of effort going on globally. There's a lot of reactors that are now coming of age. And, um, and there's definitely confidence in terms of the technology on hand. So in summary, I would think that for us to consider going forward, and we're now into infrastructure development, we've got to start building now. I think uh, we've done a lot of talking. South Africa is very good at planning, very good at talking, but we've got to put shoulder to the wheel now and, and start delivering solutions in terms of service delivery. So thank you. Thank you for your time and uh, for my brief input into this chapter. It's very much work in progress. There's still a lot more research and studies, and uh, we welcome lots more students to come and join us. And I think uh, we'd like to see us progress from the What Now paper to that of a research journal paper and onto the international platform of IEEE, so that collectively we could help deepen the global and African conversation on small modular reactors and water security and make our contributions to the United Nations development goals, in particular 6, 7, and 13. Let me stop there and hand over to my colleagues. And let me return you back to, to Minx, and uh, my colleagues will take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. I appreciate that. Our next presenter is Professor Simon Connell, who's a chapter secretariat and a fellow of the SAIE. Professor Connell is a professor of physics at the University of Johannesburg. He has research interest in particle physics, nuclear physics, nuclear energy, material science, quantum physics, high performance computing and applied innovation physics. He's writing by the SA Research Funding Agency, NRF, cites him as having considerable international recognition. I hand you over now to Professor Simon Cornell. Thank you very much, Minx. <clears throat> so I'm just going to review uh, a simple concept and that is if we are in the nuclear reactor technology space, how does that speak to this concept of desalination, which, which are the choices that we have in front of us? So, we can now try and nuance the conversation on two different and six of them you have the reverse and the thermal desalination technology mm. technology it's basically being high pressure water membranes now could feed that with a warmer water supply and get small benefit. So this is um, a membrane technology. A completely different kind of technology would be a distillation. So the water would go into steam and then you have to condense it after that back into water. And here it's not necessarily mechanical. So the primary G input is heat. Could also be electricity, but primarily one is looking at heat. And then there's again a raft of sub technologies which in within the thermal process. So the, there would be the multi stage flash distillation, multi effect distillation, and even a mechanical vapor compression technology. So now we want to look at heat sources and and there's this word small modular reactor and of course there's also the conventional much larger reactors and we want to look at this issue of the overall efficiency and basically we'll look at the questions of extracting heat energy or using the electricity directly but the concept that's in our minds is the overall efficiency and optimizing that. 
So to focus in there, we're going to look at a normal Rankin cycle and also a Brayton cycle. Obviously, there's a lot of nuances then within those cycles. But the clear um, postulate is that if it was a Rankin cycle, then there would be a greater impact if you were to require uh, the exhaust to go on to produce uh, heat for a downstream process. That would be an impact on the efficiency. So as you know, the temperature difference of, of your high temperature stage and exhaust stage, that's going to give you the performance efficiency. So we must keep in mind this concept of Rankine versus Brayton cycles. And then we can quickly look at what, what are the classes of technology available to us. So we've got the small modular reactor technology. And if we look at that, we'll first take the light water reactor version of that. So it's not necessarily a very, very novel system. So it's, it's like a small version of the large light water reactors. And it would just be packaged in a small modular form and have various other enhancements. So you would then look at the efficiency in the Rankin cycle. I just want to point out is going to be around the low um, 30s or just under that. And a company that's marketing such reactors could be someone like New Scale in the United States. And they would have a significant impact on the efficiency if steam was used for thermal desalination. So it would tend to lend itself then to the reverse osmosis technology. So now what else is there available? You could have Instead of a light water reactor, you could you could have a high temperature coolant. So the examples there that are on the markets, the helium coolant, uh, sodium, lead, molten salt, etc. So the helium would, for example, be a high temperature gas reactor. And in the picture on the side is the HTRPM, the Chinese high temperature gas cooled reactor. And it has a Rankine steam cycle, which, which um, has the uh, specification that you see there. Obviously, that one has a lot of the DNA of it, of the South African pebble bed modular reactor. So a very, very high temperature uh, coolant and with then the potential that the exhaust temperature could in fact be higher. So, um, the efficiency there is going up to around 40%. And because it's got this high temperature coolant, it wouldn't have as severe an impact if you were to deploy it in a desalination role. So we could go from um, that, which still is using the Rankine cycle now to gas cooled reactors, again, high temperature coolant and go to the Brayton cycle. And um, this high temperature gas cooled reactor, it's um, got a gain now a much higher efficiency and also um, capacity to have its exhaust heat of a much higher temperature. And it could also provide its thermal energy to a thermal desalination plant with no loss of plant efficiency. So that summarizes the various concepts that we must keep in mind. And that's an introduction then to my colleague's presentation. So I'll stop it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof Connell. Our next presenter is Mr. Dave Nichols, who is the Chairman of the Nuclear Energy Corporation of South Africa. Mr. Nichols was appointed as the Chairperson of the Board of South Africa Nuclear Energy Corporation, NEXA, in January 2020 by the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy. Internationally, Mr. Nichols was the Chairman of the 
a IAEA technical working group on light water reactors from 2010 to 2016 and is currently the co-chair of the IAEA technical working group on nuclear power plant operations. He was a member of WANO's post Fukushima design review team from 2012 to 2018. I give you over now to Mr. Dave Nichols. Dave, you need to unmute. There we go. Andrew, sorry, apologies. The technology is beyond me at my old age. Is that the correct screen? Yes, it is. Yeah, your title screen, applicability. Thank, thank you. Perfect. Yeah. Just, 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 I got confused. I'm, I'm, I'm excused. So, as it says on the opening statement, I'm retired, so I'm allowed to be old and grumpy. Um, <laughs> what we talk about here, but building the last two discussions is. Um, the applicability of small modular reactors in sub-Saharan Africa. And I think it's important to understand where this is taking us, is that, um, and I'll start off with a general discussion of, uh, about energy sources in Africa. And, and the problem that we can see north of us, and also to extent in South Africa now, is that we have reasonably small grids in Africa, but more importantly, we have energy mainly provided by either his historically low cost written off plant i.e large hydro plants or small hydro plants or we have diesel generators and i'll come back a second to that which means that the in economic growth north of us is being severely constrained by lack of st stable grid and so what i put forward here is that one of the solutions to that in a carbon constrained world where the idea of building more coal stations is probably a bit challenging um is to look at small reactors and so let me start with um where am I going? Okay, um, a bit of background. And this is, you know, why aren't there more reactors in Africa now? Why is Africa the least nuclear powered continent, um, except for Australia, which has none? Um, that's really driven by the fact that when the first nuclear power reactors were put in service in, in, in the early 60s, um, to mid 60s, they were quite small. They were looking at machines of 100, 200 megawatts to begin with. But for various reasons, primarily driven by the economies of scale or the perceived economies of scale, they became bigger and bigger. And if you go out today and you issue a, 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 a marketplace to buy a what I call a classic nuclear react, commercial reactor, the smallest anyone's offering that's on the market is 600 megawatts. And that actually is not, that's a can do from the Canadians. And that's not really moving out. And the biggest is 1750 megawatts, which is an EPR. A, a French uh, EPR reactor. Um, and that range is very large. And in fact, even on a grid of like South Africa, it's difficult to imagine us putting a 1700 megawatt machine possibly on the grid system. What came out in the industry, not for Africa, I hasten to add, but for to, to resolve the other problems of big reactors, that is the big investment size and the um, issues that came from that, was the concept of small modular reactors where the economies of scale were created not by building bigger and bigger machines and spreading the design cost over a larger amount but building machines in essentially a mass-produced style factory style um, and the view was taken that in fact if you look at the costings of nuclear plants in detail you'll find that an enormous amount of that costing is one-off costing for each plant is learning is the design and to put it in context at the moment in Africa, the only two countries in Africa which have, have an operation or are currently building nuclear power reactors is South Africa and Egypt. South Africa with Cuba from the um, 1980s when it was put in service, um, and Egypt, El Daba, um, just, just west of Alexandria, where they have contracted to construct four 1200 megawatt nuclear reactors. And the reason those countries, the only countries in Africa that have touched nuclear plant is because of the size of their grids. 
both South Africa and Egypt's grids are in the order of 30 plus thousand megawatts, which makes a thousand megawatt machine actually a credible installed capacity. If you've got a grid of 100 megawatts, you cannot put a 100 megawatt machine on the grid because your whole thing is controlled. So if we move on, let us just look at a bit of background. So how big are, how short is that the African continent of electricity? And this probably should be the one graph that should worry every African politician. Um, and that is that if you look at the amount of watts per person in the grid, so take the installed capacity on the system, national grid, and divide it by the number of people in the country, what you see is South Africa sitting here with about 820, 830 watts per person installed capacity. The next highest number is Zambia at about 140. And then it goes right down to Niger. And all those countries are predominantly crying out for some way to bring their electricity back in, 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 in up to provide growth. Because as we've seen in South Africa, over the last 10, 12 years, is that as soon as you remove reliable, consistent electrical supply from the country, which South Africa did essentially in 2006 onwards, when we said to when ESCOM said to the heavy users, we can't supply any more capacity because we haven't built the plant, then your industrial growth falls dramatically. And that essentially is what happened to South Africa over the last 12 years. Um, and it's and, and, and is a, a problem. Thing. But then comes the question of how unreliable is unreliable. And I've got a couple of graphs on unreliability, which shows the impact on Africa of unreliability. Um, this is, uh, and again, the, the bottom is, this, this information came from a paper, paper by Carnegie Mellon. Um, what it looks at is how many hours a year do you as an average customer not have, have mains power? Now, if you're in Nigeria, it's something about over half a year, because 8760 hours in a year. So at 4,500, you've got more hours without power than with power. Now, all the countries are sitting at about above 500, except going towards it to the end, um, except for South Africa's right at the end, and that, that's actually 50 hours, um, which we think is. So if you look at that graph and you say, what do we want to get down to to get the reliability into an area where people can safely invest in large industrial plants, which is going to be the key to growing in the world economy? And you would say, well, South Africa must be okay. Mozambique's not too bad, but yeah, we're going to think about Zimbabwe upwards, maybe. But then you look at actually what South Africa really looks like, because we know that we've had load shedding, and that 50 hours is in the load shedding. And I'll put this, comp this, this view to you, which says that's actually a, a graph of ESCOM's current load shedding history from 2007, which is the first time we did it, of the number of gigawatt hours ESCOM believes it shed. You can see it's stage, stage one through to stage six. There's no stage eight on there so far. We'll see what comes when the we unlock the country. Um, and that look, and we know that had a massive impact on the South African industrial economy in terms of hurting industry really badly. And yet that only reflects 0.6% of our supply, the, the, the 1,400 terawatt hours, so 1,400 gigawatt hours, which is 1.4 terawatt hours, only leads to about 0.6% of the 230 terawatt hours where an average is supplying into the national grid, which shows you that even that 50 hours of, es of South African uh, in interruption is actually unacceptable to a modern industrial society. You will not get investment on that basis. Um, if you believe that the solution to this is to put small distributed grids with based on renewable energy, then that's fine. But if that's true, then why is anybody worrying about ESCOM impacting future growth in this country? It remains a state that the, the, the future, the, 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 the national grids are, are universally supported by large the dispatchable plant or large dispatchable plant. So the, having said all that, so someone's going to put something into these grids if we're to grow Africa, which is um, dispatchable and low carbon. Clearly, the first choice in many, many ways is large hydro. If you've got a good river and you've got a good, good situation, then you should install large hydro plant. 
because that is low carbon, uh, environmentally benign, and is classically quite low cost. Unfortunately, that's a question of, geog uh, of, of geography, and most countries have already used up the, the resources they've got. A good example is South Africa, where we have essentially zero or virtually zero in-country hydro capacity. So you're going to put something else on the system, and the something else is going to be have to work inside your grid. And there's a rule of thumb in the energy planning system, which says that if you're going to put that you should not have a single unit on your system, which is bigger than 10% of the total installed capacity. Otherwise, you cannot manage it. You cannot manage it because if it trips, you will end up with the whole grid being unstable. And if you end up uh, with it being out for maintenance, it's a major problem. So there's a rule of thumb which says no more than 10% of the grid is one machine, and ideally no more than 5% of the grid is one machine. And that, again, links back into South Africa. When Kuburg was being commissioned uh, of 1,000 megawatt machines, the South African grid system was, in fact, um, having a peak demand in the order of 18,000 megawatts, which means that Kuburg was coming in at about 5% per unit um, on the grid system and was sort of handleable. But it's still an issue which says that Kuburg stability is seen as a concern to the, to the, to the grid system. Um, and so, therefore, if you've got a grid, let's take Nigeria, for example, on this graph, which is the grid sizes, it's got about 10,500 megawatts of installed capacity. It could nominally take maybe a 1,000 megawatt machine on the system to sort its problems out. Um, but Nigeria is very much the outlier. 200 million people, you can argue it's the second biggest GDP in Africa or the biggest, depending on whose numbers you believe in, up in South Africa and Nigeria. But it's still a touch and go whether it can really take any of the new build nuclear reactors, um, the classical nuclear reactors. Um, as you can see, for the rest of the countries in, in Africa, then you're sitting at figures of around 200 megawatts on your 2,000 megawatts on your grid, so 2,000 megawatts on your grid, which limits the size of your machine to about 200 megawatts or so. Um, an alternative would, of course, be to actually link these countries together and to have regional grids. But the degree in which you're going to see eco uh, politics overcoming that is probably quite challenging in general. So if we look at this, then we end up saying, and I come at the beginning, that small modular reactors could offer into Africa, given the sizes of between 50 and 300 megawatts, that kind of size range, and I'll come back to that in a second, um, could offer a solution for um, the African grid system. It would not have a carbon issue. So the 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 problem of um, uh, uh, climate change would not be an issue, and it um, would give you the stability potentially, which allows you to um, bring industry into the countries that all these countries are currently very very important to. So, as my last slide, and I'm being um, what would be the requirements for small modular reactors to be a successful rollout in Africa? And more importantly, what would be them so that Africa could take advantage and start recreating a, a grid system which supported industrial growth? Well, I'm going to start out by saying you want something like 50 to maybe 200 megawatts in size. Your previous graph, you're looking at an awful lot of African states have got grids, grids of about 2,000 megawatts. So 200 megawatts starts making sense in that that size. But there are a couple of things which are not. And so that's not like a current nuclear reactor. Current nuclear reactors are set of about 1,000 megawatts normally, ranging from 600 to 1750, but 1,000, 1,200 megawatts, way too big for these grids. Um, the second one, so, so that's where the small modular reactor fits in. The second thing is standardized design with short construction periods. The classical nuclear plant, because it is very large, tends to be almost a bespoke machine. Everyone's reactors are slightly different, and they haven't got short construction periods. From when you start spending money to when the things in service can be 10 years. You've got to bring that down to a figure of three or four years at least to make it viable. And a standardized design means the overheads of design have got to be off the shelf. Like when you buy, an airline in Africa buys a new Boeing 737, 
it ends up buying a standardized plane. It does not say, I want one with three engines, not two, please. So standardized design comes to the next thing, which is probably the one of the most dramatically important ones and different to current generation approach. And that's simplified regulation, probably on a regional basis. It's worth bearing in mind that the South African National Nuclear Regulator, uh, NNR, at Centurion, has around 170 staff, which is a, a good, the majority of them are involved in essentially supporting the licensing of the Kubo power station, which itself has about 1,700 staff. And of those 1,700, probably a large chunk of them are actually to do with regulation and control. So if you end up with a small number of nuclear reactors in a country, you may find if you go the, the way we do with licensing of large reactors, the licensing authority will have a bigger staff number than you actually have on the nuclear plant because a standard SMR is looking at numbers of between 100, 150, should we say, on the site. And also, the economics of doing that makes it so that the next thing that SMRs have to bring to the table is standardized machines that lead to simplified regulation. In other words, a standardized regulation, which also probably on a regional basis. So we have a an African Union or, or, or Southern African power pool body, which essentially is, is certified by all the countries to provide a licensing service to them. So then you've got the reactors supporting one, um, one design or maybe two designs. But clearly, that's a really good starting point. But the next issue is, is clearly as important. Although your alternative power cost is diesel generators in many countries. And I've seen numbers that tell you that in somewhere like, like uh, uh, I think it's Tanzania, I could be wrong, um, or Zambia, say Zambia, in Zambia, the, the, the tariff is, is running at about six cents US, but the actual accepted cost for diesel generators is about uh, 40 cents US. You've got to make them with competitive economics so that even if they do compete with, with, with um, diesel generators, as the grid develops, they mustn't be stranded assets. They mustn't have a tariff which is quite bluntly too high for the uh, long term. So competitive economics would appear from the numbers being produced by the um, uh, SMR companies, and I, can, I haven't time to dig into those details, but about five cents per kilowatt hour is probably the end point when you've got a, a, a significant fleet of them and the funding is being done as a standard infrastructure funding is funded nowadays. Um, up to about 14 cents, which is slightly more speculative in terms of slightly more first of a class machines and slightly more uh, higher interest rates reflecting a perceived risk. And it's just worth bearing in mind that when we talk to economics, if you look at the wind power in South Africa, between bid window one and the current bids, almost all the reduction in cost is not the reduction in the cost of the capex, but in fact, the cost of the capital. In other words, the, the risk factor and the interest costs. So that's the second thing. It will be competitive economics, which means you're coming in, ideally, at something close in terms of dollars per kilowatt installed for a classical nuclear plant. In other words, they've got to come down in, in cost to match they're coming down in size. Uh, they've got to have simplified regulation and operations so they don't have the overheads that something like a Kubo plant has. Um, and they've got to have financing, a low risk environment where you've got a situation where your risk is running at levels which are um, uh, acceptable to the financial side of things. And last, but in no sense least, for SMRs to roll out across Africa, you've got to get political acceptance. And the indications are that the acceptance in Africa will be quite reasonable. Almost more likely acceptance problems is gonna probably be acceptance from the, um, some of the first world countries that are concerned at the idea of um, nuclear power in African countries. Um, and also the concern that whoever is the vendor of the nuclear plant ends up being politically very powerful in the country who buys the nuclear plant. So to put it in simple terms, if you're ending up buying American nuclear reactors, the US government will see itself having a significant influence over your state. 
and the rest of the and the other major powers will see the US as having undue influence in that country and vice versa. If, for example, you were buying a Chinese nuclear reactor, the Americans would see that as being politically unacceptable to themselves. So that's the sort of political acceptance problem I see there. So if I can just recap, and this is my last slide, um, the point I'm going to say is that SMRs have come along in the world to meet a need in the first world to reduce the size and the exposure of nuclear plants. In other words, they want something smaller and simpler that they can build by off the shelf and get the cost down by the economies of scale of manufacture. They were not developed originally to meet the needs of the African continent, they were developed to meet the needs in the rest of the world. However, they are the only kind of reactors that are of a size which are relevant to the majority of the African states. Again, I exclude the really big countries energy-wise for South Africa and, 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 and um, Egypt, but every other country is saying they want nuclear power because they want to get something which is non-carbon emitting, dispatchable, stable, um, but that leaves them in a hole. Um, it doesn't compete with, with hydro because clearly hydro is the first choice in any country uh, in the world, in my opinion. But it does mean that to get that to work and that to get that, you've got to get standardized design with short construction periods. That's the outcome of that. But the most important thing for Africa is probably simplified regulation. Because if you can get those first two sorted out, like buying a Boeing 737 or an Airbus 320. You don't have to worry about regulation if you are South African airline buying a Airbus 320. It comes with a regulation package with it. We've got to get the same situation on nuclear power and probably on a regional basis. And that should lead to competitive economics, which will give us a bit to grow the South African economy based on reasonable price power across the African, reasonable cost, reliable power across the African continent. I think the important thing to understand is that the degree to which you can tolerate interruptions to your power supply is extremely limited. And I go back to that discussion of South Africa is way better than the rest of Africa in terms of interruptions. And yet we still know that for the last 10 years, we've been causing chaos by having limited interruptions to power. And the last one is how you get the political acceptance um, in the world that we're going to see a Africa with a plethora of small nuclear plants across the continent. And with that, I will hand back to Minx. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nichols. I appreciate it. We are now going to just answer a few questions. Um, our first question is from Mayanda Noah. If we go modular technologies, how do you see opportunities for addressing unemployment challenges of South Africa? And she just asked a second question then, how many employment opportunities would modular reactors generate, including downstream opportunities? Any one of my panelists? If I may, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, I think employment, there are two aspects to employment from a nuclear program. Uh, first of all, the, the experience that we've got, and I'm going to slip back into my previous life as ESCOM's CNO, we looked, did a study on how many jobs were created by Kuberg and the Kuberg construction and the construction of, of, of power stations. And this shows a very, very direct correlation between the amount of money you spend on, in, in constructing new power stations and job creation. If you ask the people at Lepalali, you will see that we have had a we have doubled the GDP of Lepalali with building Madupi and Madupi up there. Um, and clearly, downstream is very much an effect of the the national economy will grow if we can offer investors stable energy supply. Cost is a secondary issue. Primarily, is supply. You can work around costs somehow, but if there's no electricity, the cost is infinite. To be somewhat cynical. The cost of power from PV panels at midnight is infinite because you've got zero output divided by some cost. So the employment issue is very real. Um, I think what's also exciting about small modular reactors in Africa and South Africa as a launch vehicle for that is very interesting is that if you're going to get into producing a serial production item and you look at the scope in South Africa, in Africa, and if you just take the countries in Africa that I listed, that, that 14 countries there, and look at the diff, at their percentage of electrification and their grid size, and you just assume that with the 
that the height of electrification you would pro rata increase the grid capacity, you end up with about 700 nuclear reactors, little 100 megawatt machines being built. That is a mass production scale. And so far, nobody in the world has got a production line making these things. So if we as South Africa were the, the springboard for Africa, then you end up building an industry rather than merely importing components. You become the maker of the, the product in much the same way as, for example, early on in the cell phones, Finland through Nokia became the world's maker of cell phones, you know, Nokia. And I don't know how they did that. But if you're the first, if, if, if we can get this going, then we can create a manufacturing exporting industry both exporting into the rest of Africa and potentially elsewhere in the world out of this process. So numbers, um, a 2000 megawatt nuclear program is, is, is by analysis generates about 1.2 million job years over the tw first 20 years of its life. So significant impact on the economy, significant impact on growth. Does that answer the question appropriately? I can, I didn't bring numbers to the table to that one, but I can do it. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Mr. Nichols. Uh, another question we have is from Nontokoza Dubazani. He says, by having, by having the SMR, does this lessen the effect nuclear plant have on our atmosphere? What, what, I have to ask everyone, like, what impact nuclear plants has on the atmosphere? I mean, the first problem we've got is that nuclear power doesn't actually create carbon, uh, uh, doesn't create uh, global greenhouse gases. Um, so, you know, my answer is, I no, it doesn't change the effect of nuclear power in the atmosphere because there isn't any to begin with. Thank you, Mr. Um... Uh, sorry, the, the next question we have is from Roger Cormack. How do you ensure the security of NMR if these are placed all over, even next door? How do you stop, for example, some anti-nuclear activists from causing a nuclear disaster? I, I, uh, the, the first answer is that all the SMRs being produced, being proposed, have what is called some measure of what's called inherent safety. In other words, the prospect and as part of the requirement for simplified regulation the concept that if you actually go to the plant and you make a complete mess and you let, let hooligan get take charge of the plant and try and destroy it you may write off the power station but you won't release activity it's sort of often called walk away safety the concept that you could physically walk away from the plant in the middle of an accident and that is basically one of the criteria for, for an smr to be seen as viable so the first comment is if you if you if the anti-nuclear lobby could certainly harm the nuclear plant by blowing up the transformer and blowing up the whatever but they wouldn't actually cause the release of activity um the other issue to go with that of course is proliferation and and, and, and a lot of the smrs have very long fuel cycles to limit the amount of fuel handling and therefore limit the prospect so it is a risk but if if if, if someone on this is listening who, who is a good who is a potential terrorist my advice to you is go find another target because nuclear plants are not very good at killing people. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Another question we have is from Vasu Chetty. Um, he asking, uh, what is the rationale of smaller generation plants versus large plants? Okay. Um, the real answer is that when you build a nuclear, uh, let me get a bit of comp complexity. If you build a reactor, you've got to make sure you can handle, if you lose all the systems and you the, the reactor goes on making heat after you shut it down, right? and th there were some graphs on, on, on the presentation from um, Professor Naidu, the, the, there was some graph of what's called the decay heat. So if we take something like Kuberg and we trip the unit today, um, it's currently making nearly 3,000 megawatts of thermal heat in the core, which is a block about three meters square. If you if you trip the reactor and the reactor shuts down, the chain reaction will stop, but in fact, you will go on making uh, about 200 megawatts of heat immediately afterwards from what's called decayed, which will decay over the next period of days and weeks and months and everything else. So the way fundamentally a small modular reactor work, and the way we handle that on a Kuberg type or a big reactor is you put in systems to absolutely ensure that whatever happens, you can go on cooling the core, that lump of metal, lump of uranium, 
after you've had the disaster. A small modular reactor, the reason they ended up being small is because if you make that reactor small enough, you can make the loss of heat after the accident completely passive. So something like a PBMR, which is I know very well, because literally, if you walked away from the plant and broke all the pipes and walked away, it would lose more, it would, it would, it would shut itself down because of physics, and it would then just lose this heat through the walls of the pressure vessel such that the fuel would never exceed the, the failure point. So the two solutions is you make a big reactor with these big complex systems to make sure it's safe and the regulation that goes with those complex systems and then you try and make the system as big as you can to average out all those overheads on the cost of the plant or you get rid of that problem entirely by saying no my plant is so simple and small it doesn't have that problem and i think if you go back into history and you go back to the 1960s when the decisions were being made people did not realize safety would get so expensive so the view was it was cheaper to build a more power dense core and had the penalty of some safety systems around it, which were quite cheap, a diesel generator and a pump, um, rather than limit the size of reactor to not need the diesel generator and the pump. What's shown us over the last 50 years is that in reality, the cost of proving absolute safety, or whatever that means, has become so expensive that the simpler solution is stick to a smaller machine, which actually doesn't have those requirements. Can I add in a few things there? So uh, what Dave has been speaking about is something that's inherently safe. So I think a good example is the sun. If the sun were to burn up its fuel faster, it would expand, its density would be lower, the reaction rate would go down and it would throttle itself back and then it would cool down and then once it cooled down, it would get denser and then the reaction rate would go up. So it would sort of just breathe for billions of years, regulating its own output by physics. And that's a similar thing that's happening in a small modular reactor. It's the materials that it uses, the temperature that it's at, um, everything is designed in, in such a way that it should be able to have this passive safety. And all of the three nuclear nightmares are dealt with in that same way, but by the design. So one aspect is, of course, it's going to have a much stronger safety case. But the other thing that also was in, in these talks was you want the Model T Ford of reactors. You want to bring the price down. You want to simplify the regulation. So you want the Model T Ford. And, and so that's why if someone's going to be ordering hundreds of them, then it's better. Then also, you would like it to be more appropriate in many situations. As soon as it's modular, you could put a package of 10 down or you could put just one down. So you, you're going to have something that's much more flexible and that's where it becomes appropriate to Africa's grid. And I think the grid issues are also very important. You can't necessarily anywhere just plonk down two gigawatts because there's also got to be the load that can absorb that two gigawatts. There can be a lot of scenarios which are more distributed where the small modular reactor is much more appropriate, have much more flexibility. So I think there's, there's many advantages coming out of this uh, swing to small modular reactors. Thank you very much, Simon and Dave. Another question we have from Mr. Franz van Jeronen. Would a nuclear SMR be available for Cape Town seawater desalination of around 100 megalitres per day? I think it's megalitres per day, plus enough electricity to feed such a plant. He just goes on to say a few of these would be required over the next few years to supply Cape Town with 50% of its potable water. Uh, Rosa Tom or Dave? Rosa Tom, okay. possibly? Oh, I, 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 I'll take that one. The answer is, is actually, I think that the um, the ability, I mean, Kuburg, there's been talk already of a very big desalination plant um, next to Kuburg, where I think about 500 megalitres a day 
or something. Um, but certainly, there is no technical reason why you couldn't build more Kubo type units um, to do desalination. It's what, it's what the um, Egyptians are doing now. There are four reactors they're ordering for El Daba, uh, which I think construction's already started, it was about to start. Um, actually, are linked to a massive desalination plant to provide the water to Alexandria and, and Cairo. Um, and it really is an enormous desalination plant. So there's no, no reason we can't build a nuclear heat source. Um, and SMRs would certainly work, um, but it's really just you, you, you've got to have enough power. And, and the nice thing about designing a nuclear ranking site, going back to um, so, uh, Simon, Professor Connell's comments, um, there's a balance for how you do it, but essentially it's efficient to take out heat. If you really want to make water, you can bleed steam off, off the low pressure side of your system to drive that process. So yes, there's no reason we couldn't. And it's also worth bearing in mind that in the request for information issued by DMRE last month, just over a month ago, that there was explicit request for the request for information in terms of large reactors, it was actually in the large reactor side, to say, could you actually provide any information on how you would integrate a water desalination plant into your power station? And that was exactly for the reason of trying to put, if Kuburg 3 and 4 ended up, A, supporting the grid in the Western Cape, because Kuburg is now, uh, the Western Cape is more than doubled since Kuburg was built, would also provide water supply into Cape Town very nicely. Um, and that would be about 2032, 33 timeline. So that's kind of on the table. But yeah, no problems at all. Thank you, Dave. Ryan, you want to add? Uh, yeah, I think they've pretty much covered everything. But uh, as I said in my introduction earlier, uh, this wouldn't be the first time that we, we've uh, delivered reactors that both provide electricity as well as water. So um, it is certainly possible, uh, like Dave said as well, our project Aldabar in Egypt, uh, they, they're linking large desalination to that, um, as well as our projects in, in India uh, have desalination. So. Yeah, it's most certainly possible to to add new desalination to to um, new units in in Cape Town. I think it makes absolute sense. I mean, the, the city desperately needs new uh, a new source of water, and the ocean's right there. So I think it, it is a very sensible option that they're exploring in the RFI. Excellent, thank you, Ryan. Yeah, I do I do agree with you. Um, another question we have from Ludwig Riarua. Excuse my uh, uh, saying your surname, sorry. Is there work being done to balance the aspects in policy development associated with politics, economics, and regulation? Any one of my panelists? Internationally, yes, quite a lot. Um, whether it'll come to anything, I, I, I can't comment. But certainly there's been a number of regulators that have got together. I suppose there's no one on this panel who's a regulator. Um, but I know that the South African National Grid Regulator, the NNR in South Africa is part of a team um, called MDEP. I think it's called MDEP, which is a grouping of regulators trying to agree on standardization um, across designs. And I'll give you an example of the, the problems it leads to. You. Um, if you adopt the regulations of the country that builds it, that makes life straightforward for you. If you demand the local regulations get applied, it can add about 30, 40% to the price of the project. So one of the reasons that, that, that for example, the Hungarian uh, project, and there's two projects in Europe, one's in Belarus and one's in Hungary, being built by Rosatom, and no advert for the, so, but apparently the Hungarian one is about 30% more expensive than the Belarus one because Belarus accepted Russian regulations, Hungarians said you must re-engineer bits of the plant to meet our requirements. The same thing with uh, Hinkley Point C, which is way more expensive than anyone else in the world is, partly because the British regulator said you must, for example, re-engineer the plant to meet UK fire regulations. French fire regulations aren't good enough for us, which is not a big difference in outcome, but it means the buildings are a bit small, different size, bit different shape, and that gives you all kinds of cost issues. So. There is significant effort going on in, in the regulatory space to have a standardized approach to show that all regulations 
have similar. Um, and I just hope it comes off. It's like the aircraft industry where if the FAA in the States certifies an aircraft good to fly, uh, every other regulator um, tends to accept that as being adequate regulation. Maybe not after 737 MAX, but that's, that's good. But essentially there's good efforts going in that area. And But this one, if we look at the SMRs in Africa, it would need an African agreement, possibly under the AU, because you don't need to have an NNR organization for every country if they're all licensing the same reactor under the same conditions across the, con across the continent. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. We have another Could question. From yes, sorry, Simon. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to interpret just the politics and economics part of that question, maybe not so much the regulation part, because the the space of energy, I think, it is a very politicized space, and one would like economics and uh, technological literacy to play a bigger role and politics a lesser role and i think there's so much perception in it that that maybe is is not correct so so i think if i just say a, a, a little bit there i mean at the moment there's a claim coming from the dmre many many times that the cheapest producer of electricity a generation aspect that is our nuclear fleet I think it's something like 20 cents an hour, and <clears throat> that includes all those other costs like return to greenfield and the insurance of an accident, and um, and it includes the cost of, of uh, storage of the waste and so on. So everything that you want, you know, um, for for uh, the sustainability of the planet's also in that 20 cents um, per kilowatt hour. And and it's like that because the the nuclear um, plant lasts 40 or 60 or 80 years, but the um, RP is generally over a much shorter time cycle, and it doesn't really give any scope for the economics to manifest. Like you wouldn't be able to say it's going to cost 20 cents a kilowatt hour after. 30, 40 years going all the way up to 80 years. You wouldn't be able to say that. And so I think there isn't yet a level field in the economic sense to compare apples with apples. It's each different modality of producing energy is so complicated in terms of procurement and operations and cost of fuel and insurances. So it's very, very difficult to compare apples with apples. And I fully agree that the conversation needs to be much better informed from economical and technological literacy point of view. And I just want to say that was very important for the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers to initiate for the country, the nuclear chapter, to bring together all the people who can contribute to that conversation and have the conversation in a very informed way. And, and that's also for these uh, what now webinars so so um we, we now have a platform uh, starting within the south african institute of electrical engineers which which we want to spread and and we really want to facilitate that conversation that was uh i think motivating the question because because we we want that conversation to be had in a way that the people with the appropriate skills uh, and ethics and can be trusted can make those inputs clarify the situation thank you thank you uh, very much so sorry. Sorry, I think I'm going to be a, uh, just to go a bit farther I, 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 I'm always worried when someone says one should be trustworthy because the idea of saying anyone saying they're not is a desperate unlikely but I would just comment that one of the problems we have in the industry in terms of economics is discussing the value of energy versus the energy the, 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 the value of capacity and let me explain that very simply and that's why so everyone says well the price of power from a pv panel is whatever it is 50 cents 60 70 cents whatever the number is the reality is that you understand that what you everybody in this webinar who in south africa is sitting with some light bulb on near them and they're paying if they're domestic around two rand a unit for the power from the light bulb 
that's what I'm paying. I don't you uh, and but the reality is that of that two rand, only about 30 cents is paying for the energy, that is the coal that's being used to burn for that light. One rand seventy is the capacity of being able to deliver it when you want it. That when you turn the switch on, it comes on. And that I think is a fundamental concept, people. So you cannot compare the price of energy with the price of electricity in this sort of site because you want 24 seven. And that's one thing that's missing is everyone's confusing some of the economics of this thing. Now, it isn't it is no in no sense that simple, but essentially it is worth bearing in mind that when you pay your bill for electricity, around 85% of it is actually contributing to the fixed cost of having the availability of energy. And 15% is paying for the energy itself. And you can argue we can manage that by dynamic load management, which is a buzzword I hear in the industry. And my comment is dynamic load management is what I call load shedding. And we've tried that one and no one likes it too much. With that, I will move on back to you, Minx. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Um, just to get back to what Simon was saying about our nuclear chapter, um, the SRE, if you are interested in joining the nuclear chapter or the power and energy section, you're welcome to send me an email, minx at siree.org.za, and I'll put you in, uh, in, in connection with the right person to actually come and share your knowledge with these sections and interest groups. Our second last question for today is from Nkululeko Kumalu. And this is actually directed at Prof. Pat Naidu, which I think you'll be able to um, answer this. What measures are in place to integrate the nuclear curriculum into early levels of power engineering course in the universities? Pat? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we've got a, a program uh, that we we'll want to launch. Uh, we want to start with what we term short learning programs as part of the continuous professional development curriculum whereby uh, practicing engineers, scientists, technologists uh, who are currently working, they engaged in their own uh, activities, can participate and develop uh, and complete modules. And then collectively, we could assemble the modules to give them credits towards uh, further studies and, uh, there are, and thereafter try and uh, complete a mini or small dissertation to complete the requirements for the award of a postgraduate degree uh, in engineering. So we'll build on your bachelor's and then take you up to the master's level and then get you onto the platform towards uh, further studies as in doctoral work and postdoctoral work. So there's definitely a, a move uh, and we're going to initiate that conversation uh, between not just University of Johannesburg, but all South African universities and uh, the Institute, South African Institute of Electrical Engineers, and try and start um, getting that offering onto the table for our members and for the practicing uh, engineers out in, in industry. Thank you. Fantastic, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. Can I add? Yes, Brian. So, uh, just from, from Rosatom's perspective, uh, just for everyone to know, we offer various um, bursaries every year to study in Russia. So the undergraduates, they first have to do a year of Russian studies um, and we sort of cover the full tuition and most of accommodation. We don't cover flights. Uh, we've currently got 300 African students studying on various bursaries in Russia and every year we make available for South African students as well. And then you can do your postgraduate with us as well, so either masters or, or, or PhD. Um, and those courses, the, the postgraduates can be done in English. So if you want more information, please feel free to contact us, um, and I will share share how you can actually get involved in those programs. Uh, Minx, I'll share that information with the SAIE as well, so that next year we can try to source some students through your organisation. Absolutely, thank you, Ryan. I had the privilege that um, Rosa Tom flew me to Russia two years ago and I actually went to the Tomsk University and met some of those um, students studying on bursaries from um, various African countries and it's seriously a remarkable program. So if anybody's interested, please just email me and I will forward it to Ryan and his team 
or Ryan will send me information which I can then forward to you. Our last question from Nicholas Smith. Uh, considering the stigmatism of surrounding nuclear, how do we get past this and prove to populations that nuclear is safe? Any one of my panelists? Try and have a discussion. All right, uh, go for it. Try. I think the answer, Nicola, is it's very difficult because um, as an industry, we are extremely good at explaining our risk factor and how we take all this money to avoid the risk. Um, my experience is that people, it's interesting, we did a study at Kuburg years ago. We polled population as to whether they thought how safe, how far you had to live from a nuclear power station to be safe. What we found was almost universally, everybody said if they were one kilometer away from Kuburg, they said one kilometer was good enough. If they were 10, they said 10 was good enough. Um, so the answer is, it, 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 it is a function of showing people the and discussing the real issues of nuclear safety. I'll give you an example, I quote. If you look at the statistics in the world, it is more dangerous to have PV on your roof than a nuclear power station next door. And that might sound weird until you realize the Americans did a study of how many, how many people fall off roofs in the States and kill themselves and then they looked at how many hours you spent on your roof trying to maintain your, your solar panels. And they proved that, in fact, that the risk factor from solar panels on your roof was greater than that from a nuclear power station next door. How we sell that, don't quite know. But it's the general answer is that it's one of those facts that we as an industry love explaining how there is one in 100 million year chance of Cuba killing you. I know it's all the chance of it killing me. And you say, well, no, actually, the 100 million years is the same as the Earth being wiped out by a meteorite. Um, and that's why moving to the small modular reactor, where essentially there is no physical process that leads from an initiating event to release is important. Because proving absolute safety is very difficult. Um, but that's the Can biggest I challenge. to Dave's comment. Is that OK? Yes. Hey, Simon, yeah, so, so I I think it's a very fascinating question and you know <clears throat> Dave answered it uh, talking about statistics and it's very similar you can give people the statistics of being eaten by a shark uh, when you're swimming and driving their car on a national highway you know at uh, Easter or Christmas and to, to go on holiday and people think nothing really of of a road trip, but then they're very frightened about uh, swimming in the ocean. And humans are like that. Um, so, so you can look at how many people really died from Fukushima, because if one approached it like an actuary, they would regard Fukushima when all the dust has settled as being a massive example of how safe nuclear power is, to, to the extent that the Americans have said we don't want to relocate people at uh, 20 millisieverts a year uh, natural background because it's so traumatic when you relocate people and and there's many occupations now which already have that natural background and and then you find that it's it's an issue where really people have a fear of something that uh, they don't understand and there I think it's the COVID-19 um, that we have now, the coronavirus, it, it really reminds me of that because you have these asymptomatic people that can do asymptomatic transmission. You can, you, we're in a situation that we could be close to someone who could possibly kill us uh, and we wouldn't know anything about it. And the way we have to protect ourselves is we do things that are, are, are not entirely intuitive. So, for example, wearing a mask, if I wear a mask, I protect the other person more than myself and vice versa. And I think that's why it's very hard for some countries to flatten the curve because you really need to be quite well informed before you do things that they're not entirely intuitive, but they make a huge difference. Like it, it's uh, very low tech um, 
common sense things that will help us to flatten the curve. So that's, uh, I think that, that that's a, for me a very, very interesting analogy. And then you have people on the front line um, who are, are really at the cold face of extreme danger to themselves and their family, but because their knowledge is so good on, on how to work in that situation, they, they actually can do that. And, and, and there again, it's a situation where knowledge of, of, of the virus and how it could transmit and infect is what basically keeps you safe. So, so I think um, somehow uh, we need really examples ultimately, more examples um, where, where nuclear really is the solution. And then there needs to be a much higher level of discussion because otherwise people's conclusions that it's unsafe is not at all motivated by fact. I, I will just, if I may add a quick comment to that one. My joke always is the best way to tell how safe something is, is how close does the plant manager live to the plant? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Um, just to reiterate what Simon was saying, that it comes down to a lack of education and if we educate people um, and prove to our populations how safe nuclear really is then it will it will change the whole dynamic and i think maybe this is a call on because i've got dave nichols and pat and simon here and ryan that perhaps we should start with a series of content and articles about how safe nuclear is i think this was a very very interesting discussion and i ended here and I want to just thank you, every single one of you, for joining us today. Our panelists, Mr. Nichols, Pat Naidu, Simon Connell, Ryan Collier, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I just want to say briefly that the recording of today's webinar will be on the SIE TV YouTube channel. It will be uploaded onto the website as well as the presentations. Our next SIE technical talk is Monday, 27th of July at 6 p.m. That's hosted by the Lot Research chapter, and they discuss the impact of COVID-19 on the econo economy and electrical demand. I thank you for your attendance, and this will have also CPD validation. The number will be sent on your attendance certificate. Thank you very much, and have a good afternoon. Goodbye. <laughs>